In our session two lecture, we're going to be talking about entering and reviewing clinical data. So, so far we've talked about the data management plan and what's involved in that, what information is included in that. We've also talked about um, case report form development and some of the elements associated with that. So now we have deployed those two items and now we're ready to start entering and reviewing clinical data. So let's take a look at the learning objectives that we have for this module. We're going to discuss how clinical data is entered uh, via the case report form page if it's a paper study or through the clinical database if it's an electronic data capture study. We're going to understand the purpose of data review. We're going to review the critical variable list and the edit specification documents. And we'll discuss and understand some of the common issues associated with clinical data. So let's talk about entering clinical data. So the first thing we need to understand is the case report form that we talked about in earlier modules. That's going to be our primary instrument to collect data during the clinical trial. And we either collect that or someone at the site does by entering it onto a case report form page if it's paper, or they may enter the data directly into the database if it's an electronic data capture study. We'll have an entire module later in the course on electronic data capture. So the site originally collects the data on source documents, which can be a medical uh, record, could be a lab report, or a procedure report, or it could just be a piece of paper that they write down a patient's blood pressure and vital signs on. So that's considered our source document uh, because that's where the original data was captured. And then for the purposes of our trial, we're going to transpose that onto the case report form, either on paper or electronically. And then that's going to represent the data that we're going to use in our trial. So then the third element here is that monitors or CRAs, clinical research associates, <clears throat> they're going to travel out to the site and they're going to review the case report form data <clears throat> against the source data and verify that it was recorded correctly and that it was recorded accurately. So here we have a funny looking cartoon of a monitoring visit where you can see the monitor there. She comes in, she's got her clipboard and her glasses and she's got her, her glove on her hand. She's going to go through those study files and find every little error that possibly could exist. And of course, there's the study team. They're cowering behind the door. Um, a lot of times this actually is uh, is the opposite. Uh, in many cases, the, the study team is the one that's controlling a lot of that. And sometimes the monitor themselves are the ones that are more intimidated. Uh, but we'll go through this as we go along. So what is the goal of reviewing data? Our goal is to achieve the highest data quality of, of analyzable data sets for statistical use and regulatory submission while strictly following regulatory requirements and guidelines for this process. So essentially, we want to have a, as accurate a data set as possible that our statisticians and other analysis or, or, or analysts can use to determine whether or not that data set is suitable for regulatory submission. So we want to clean as much of that as we can and have a nice clean data set. That's what we're, that's what our objective is. So whose job is it to do this? Who's responsible for it? Well, first, the principal investigator is the key person in a clinical trial, and any data from, their, from that person's site is their responsibility, and they essentially own that data. So they have the first line of responsibility for ensuring that that data is correct and accurate. Then we may have data management teams that work at the sponsor or the CRO. They're going to uh, run their edit checks and they're going to clean that data and they're going to send queries out to the site to clarify uh, data discrepancies. So they have a key role in that. Uh, clinical research associates have a key role because they're going to go out and do their source data verification and attest that the data is accurate, that it's been recorded accurately. You've got study coordinators that work at the clinical sites. They're the ones that in most cases are going to be entering the data onto a case report form or into the database. Finally, you have uh, medical monitors. They work for the sponsor or they may work for the CRO. Their overall responsibility is to ensure patient safety 
So they want to review that data and they want it to be as accurate because they want to make sure that patients are, are, um, are participating safely in the trial. And then you have sponsors. Obviously, they have a key interest. They're the ones who ultimately that data is going to belong to because they want to submit it for regulatory approval. So all of these people, all of these individuals, all these groups assist the principal investigator in achieving the highest data quality for the study and to maintain compliance with regulatory requirements. And we'll go over some of those as we move along. So we talked about data quality. We've mentioned that a couple of times up to now, but what exactly is data quality and how do we achieve it? Well, what data quality means is that data can be supported by medical documentation, which is through a process called source data verification, and that the data is clinically logical and accurate. So, for example, if we write down that a patient's blood pressure was 900 over 10, that's not very clinically logical. No one would ever have a blood pressure reading for that. So we probably made an error when we wrote that down, even though we may have transpired it, transferred it over to a case report form, and it can be uh, verified with a source of uh, data verification method. It's still not medically logical. So we want to find those errors. And then we also achieve this by the CRAs going out and, and source document ver verifying the data as it's being entered. Medical monitors are going to review for uh, key patient data, specifically uh, data related to patient safety. And then we're going to have data management people that clean the data by running their edit checks and issuing data clarification forms or queries out to the site for them to clarify discrepancies. And we're going to find out of range values, et cetera. And then we're going to verify clinical quality of the data and compare data points such as adverse events, medical history, concomitant medications. We're going to go through that as we go along. But all of these uh, elements, all of these tasks are associated in generating uh, data quality. So let's talk about some of the tasks that are associated with data quality or some of the review activities that we're going to do. First of all, we're going to make sure that data was transcribed correctly from source documents. We're going to make sure that it was received correctly from data centers, such as sites, or we might have data that comes from a laboratory or some other uh, medical facility, and that may be entered into our database. We want to make sure that it's done correctly and accurately. Uh, we want to enter information correctly into our database systems. And then we also want it uh, updated correctly and corrections that can be validated. So we want to have an audit trail for every time a piece of data changes so we know who did it when they did it why they did it and what the purpose of doing it was so next we want to ensure that data is logical that data collected is the correct data type that it's collected at the correct visit um, and that it does not contradict other data values that were collected for that subject so every subject uh, or each subject in the trial is going to have a series of visits that they come in. and We're going to collect specific data at that visit. So we want to make sure that that's as logical as possible. Now, the way we achieve this, first and foremost, is by good case report form design to ensure that relevant data points are captured at the correct time points. And then by sending data clarification forms, uh, for missing data or any incorrect data types or other discrepancies out to the sites for them to clarify and respond back to us. So we want to ask a question. We want to ensure that data is analytical. In other words, can it be analyzed? So for example, does the data provide enough information to perform proper statistical analysis? Um, data that cannot be analyzed or cannot be analyzed very well is of limited value to us in the course of a clinical trial. So, for example, are the data types used correctly? You may have numerical data, Boolean, free text field, discrete value groups. All of these different types of data can be used during the course of our trial and they may appear in our case report form and in our database. So we want to make sure that they're used correctly and that we can get the as, qui as many quantifiable data points as we possibly can. So we achieve this once again through CRF design. 
We also do it by um, key data linking all sources to the data captured. Um, we want to ensure proper data entry and we do it by reviewing and updating data as we go along as it's clarified. So before we start reviewing data, we want to make sure that we know several things. So for example, we want to understand what systems we're using to collect the data. Is it going to be on a paper CRF? Is it going to be on an electronic data capture system, a clinical database? You know, how are we going to collect it? Then we want to know the expectations of the sponsor. You know, what do they want us to do if we're the CRO? Um, we also want to understand any good clinical practice issues that are related to data review, specifically those that apply to Title 21 CFR Part 11, which are electronic systems, electronic signatures that are, are used in clinical trials. And are our systems compliant with that particular uh, regulation? And then finally, we want to understand which data is going to be most important for the final statistical analysis. In many cases, we're going to call these critical variables or critical data. We're going to define those at the beginning of our trial and make sure that we devote a lot of effort to ensuring that those uh, particular data set or, or data uh, uh, points are as accurate as possible. So here we have another funny cartoon to take a look at. We've got two gentlemen comparing some charts and some data in a laboratory. And of course, one says, um, hmm, data don't make any sense. We'll have to resort to statistics. So that'll come into play a little later as we come along. So there's a couple of pieces of information that we want to review before we start our data review activities. Some key documents that are associated with data re review include the critical variable list, the edit specifications, uh, data entry instructions, self-evident corrections, or client or sponsor specific guidelines. I'm going to go over each of these in a little more detail as we move along. So let's talk about the critical variable list. The critical variable list identifies critical variables for the study and then guides the critical variable quality control. Normally, this would be about 10% of all of the variables that we'll collect during the course of the trial. An example of this might be, um, was informed consent completed? Yes or no? So this would be absolutely the data that we want to concentrate on the most um, as we go along. Uh, critical variables are data points which focus on the data critical to the statistical analysis. Typically, the data associated with primary safety and efficacy endpoints. These might include um, examples such as uh, QTC interval. Um, we might have ECOG level, which for a cancer study is going to uh, anticipate the, the, the level of, of, um, of participation the patient is having. Uh, we may have a quality of life uh, survey response. Uh, these will be examples of, of some some typical safety or, or efficacy endpoints in our trial. And then finally, the critical variables drive the edit specification creation and the data review. So we're going to associate a lot of, a lot of our time with those critical variables. So here's an example of a portion of a critical variable list. As you can see up at the top, this is just a, a table. In the first column, you have the, uh, the paper or the module uh, where the critical variable exists. Then in the second column, it's going to have a page number or some sort of page identifier. The concept of pages is something that's, that still exists in our clinical databases and also our CRFs to identify what portion of the database or CRF we're, we're talking about. So in this example, we have subject characteristics, um, which are in this particular study are located on page four of our CRF. And then we have uh, in the third column, the CRF fields and references. So in this case, you've got uh, date of birth, sex, race. Those are all key elements that we absolutely have to collect in a clinical trial. And then in that final column, we have the actual name of the variable, which is associated 
with that particular data point within our CRF and also associated with that data that's in our clinical database. So those names are fairly standard. We'll see some of those in the C uh, training that we'll go over uh, a little bit later in the course. So as you move down, you can see where the page numbers change and, um, and then also the, the, the module numbers. For example, there in the middle, you have adverse events. Uh, there are going to be a lot of adverse events that are collected, that are experienced over the course of a trial. We want to collect all of those. That doesn't mean all of them are serious adverse events, but we definitely want to collect as many of those uh, as we possibly can to, to ensure that we have a very accurate safety profile uh, for, our, for, our, our, for our drug. The next document that we want to talk about is our edit specifications document. This is going to document the data review plan and specifies the consistency checks or the edit checks uh, and manual checks that are going to support data review. So this is going to exist in an Excel spreadsheet. So it's going to be pretty easy to find the specific information that you're looking for. So we have a series of, of programmed edit checks that are going to run on our clinical data and they fall into several categories. For example, the first category, the E category, is going to be non-programmed edit checks uh, that are going to fire for missing values that don't carry any logic. For example, a missing date if they fail to include the patient's date of birth or maybe the uh, the date that a, a particular study visit was conducted on. You know, that would cause an edit uh, check to fire. Then our next category are going to be programmed logic uh, checks that fire uh, if there's a, some sort of logical discrepancy. You know, for example, a systolic uh, must be greater than a diastolic um, measurement for blood pressure. So let's say they got the two backwards and they put it in uh, backwards, then that would probably, that would cause an edit check to fire. So that has some level of logic in it. We also may have a range check where, for example, a blood pressure range might be, uh, you know, might be out of range. I said earlier, I think I used the example of somebody entering blood pressure of 900 over 10. You know, maybe they meant to say 90 over 70, you know, which might not be a terribly unusual um, a blood pressure reading, but they just got an extra zero in there, and that's how they recorded it and caused an edit check to fire. Then we have uh, Q or M checks, and they're going to be programmed edit checks um, that fire. They're, they're generally not going to be viewable by the site initially because they're going to need to have somebody take a look at them and determine if they need to be sent to the site. You know, an example of these would be an adverse event that's listed on a con med page, but that adverse event name isn't present on the adverse event pages. So there's something that's missing there. We would probably want to look at that and make sure before we send it out to a site, but that, that check would still fire. And then finally, we have listings, or they're called data review listings, that are programmed um, into some of our report management products such as JReview or Report Manager, and then these are going to be um, uh, listings where we actually review certain pieces of data and determine whether or not uh, we should send a query out to the site. So the example that I've listed here is uh, you know, a transfusion of more than 28 days prior to the first dose. You know, that may be something that's a, a monitor that goes out to the site and may not detect, but we could see that very quickly in our in our data as we run through some of these reports. So if you look on page 41 in your textbook, it actually shows you an, a, an example of an edit spec uh, document, so you can kind of see what one looks like. I'm going to go over one with you here in just a moment in a little more detail. So here we have an example of an edit specification <clears throat> document or edit spec. As you can see, it's going to be in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and we're going to have, depending on the complexity of our trial, we could have 
you know, several hundred of these edit checks. We could have a thousand, we could have 2000, uh, depending on what the complexity of the trial is. So if you look along the, uh, the top row there, you'll see where each of the checks has a check ID. So you can see uh, as you move down the page, if you look at the, the top, you've got the cover page. This would be the CRF header information. And as you read across, you'll see the type of, um, of check that it is. Remember when we just went over the, the E checks and the Q checks and all of those? So you'll see what type of check it is. And then you'll also see what the, uh, what the name of it is. And this is going to correspond um, you know, with some of those page numbers that we saw earlier with our critical variable list. And then each of the variables is going to have a name. And then once we move over from the variable column into the rule column, it indicates what the rule is. For example, if we look at that first a uh, or, or row there where it says that, where the variable name is initials. The rule indicates patient initials must have data present. So for every patient that we enter into the database, we must include their initials in there. So then we have a message that's in the next column and the message indicates a value for initials is missing. Please provide. So that would be the basic text that we might send out to a site if they were to leave that particular um, piece of information out, if we were sending a query to them. In most cases, this would be one that fires automatically, so they would see that text if they attempted to move beyond that field without putting any data in there. They'd see that, see that query file. So that would, uh, that would alert them to go ahead and include that. If we were to move down um, into some of the uh, some of the lower ranks. Look down into the column on electrocardiogram uh, or, or row D. I mean, if you look at the uh, the next to the last row there, you see that we have an EC, ECG. Uh, we have a, a uh, we have a variable for QT uh, that's in the next to the last row. And if you look at the rule, it says ECG interval evaluation QT must be present. So if they didn't enter any data for that, that would be an example of one that we may need to send that out to the site. More than likely, that's going to be a data point that we need to collect. But we might want to review that one before we send it out, just to be sure uh, that everything is correct on it. So this would be an example of an edit specification. It's going to contain information on every single edit check that's programmed into the database. It's going to give us what the variable name is, what page or pages it fires on, and then what the rule is, and then it will give us some, some messaging text that we can use to send our query. Uh, we'll probably want to add some information to that before we send it out. But we'll go over all of that in our query writing module a little bit later in the class. So let's take a look at some of the common issues, errors, or inconsistencies that we're likely to encounter when we start reviewing clinical data. So first, let's talk about demographics data. This is going to be data that identifies the subject by age, gender, race, or ethnicity. And it's going to be used to provide some analysis on the different groups of patients that we have and, and their association with the study data and the results. As we said earlier, the purpose of our trial is to create an analyzable data set. And we want that data set to be, or the data itself, to be generalizable across a wide population of patients as possible. So, you know, for example, we don't want to have a whole bunch of people that are uh, age 20 to 30. We don't want to have a whole bunch of people that are age 70 to 80. We want to have it generalizable as much as possible. So we can then hopefully, once we get it approved, we know that we'll see benefit in as large a, a patient population as possible. So we need to collect that demographics data in order to ensure that. So sometimes you'll see informed consent uh, data in with demographics data. So one of the reasons this is important is because in order to uh, fulfill our regulatory obligations, we have to ensure that the informed consent was conducted 
prior to any trial related procedures or visits. So for example, if you look at the last bullet item there, if we see if, if the site has entered the informed consent date as the same date as the screening visit, we're going to have a query that fires for the site to clarify that that informed consent uh, was completed before uh, any trial related procedures were done. As we said in our CRF design page, it's usually a good idea for us to not only include the date the informed consent was signed, but the time that it was signed. That'll be a good indicator that we know it was done prior to study related procedures. Some of the errors that we might see on a demographics page might include the informed consent date was after the screening visit date. Maybe they entered the dates wrong. We might want to clarify that to be sure that some protocol violation didn't occur. Uh, date of birth is not within the range for the study. So maybe our study has a certain age range and they entered the date of birth wrong so that it identifies the person as either being out, outside of that range. We may have more than one race checked. You know, usually for most clinical trials, we want to check only one race uh, for, a, for a patient. Uh, we may have female checked in an all-male subjects study or vice versa. So these are some common errors that we will, may, may find among the demographics data. So next we have inclusion exclusion criteria. So these are going to be questions that must be answered about each subject prior to the subject being enrolled in the trial. So any inclusion criteria must be answered yes. Exclusion criteria must be answered no. Now in some cases, uh, certain responses can be weighed with the approval of a medical monitor, but in almost every case, we want to ensure that, that the patient meets the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So the, the site must answer all of those questions in order to properly enroll the patient. So for most trials at almost every patient visit, we're going to take uh, vital signs or the site is going to take vital signs. And usually these are, these are four specific vital signs that are fairly standard. Uh, we're going to take temperature, uh, pulse rate or heart rate, resting blood pressure rate, a respiratory rate, and then we may have the patient uh, record, we record the patient's weight um, if it's going to be recorded uh, in the same module. So these are things, these vital signs are normally going to be collected at each patient visit. So what are some of the uh, common errors and inconsistencies that we find on vital signs? We might find missing values. Um, we might find values that are out of range. You know, for example, for blood pressure, we might have a certain range where um, uh, you know, that's what we're looking for. So in this case, the example we cite here, systolic, must be between 90 and 150. So anything outside of that range, um, we might want to ask a question about, we might want to query about. Um, we sometimes see wrong units of measure. See this a lot for taking temperature or measuring weight whether it's in degrees of uh, you know, uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit or kilograms versus pounds, we see that uh, quite frequently. Um, we also wanted to um, check for any increase in values of some measurements from the baseline values. We see this quite frequently. Um, one of the other common errors we might find that the site recorded units um, are recorded along with values in a numeric only field. So that could prompt a query uh, to clarify that. We might find that they uh, recorded respiratory rate in the wrong field uh, where they should have recorded uh, pulse rate. Those are two that can sometimes get mixed up because depending on what they are, they might actually you know, be a normal range in one or the other. So those are some of the things that we want to that we're likely to, to find some inconsistencies with. So medical history. This is going to be information that's gained by the physician or the medical practitioner by asking the patient questions about their health, both past and present. And this is going to aid in diagnosing and providing care to the patient. 
So some of this information is going to be transferred over to our case report form. So everyone's gone to the doctor where you might fill out a form that says, you know, do you or anyone in your family ever have this, this, or this? Those would be examples of questions that would be conducted uh, when taking the patient's medical history. And we're going to record some of that in our case report form. So some of the common errors that we typically find on the medical history page, if it's a paper study, we may have illegible entries. Uh, for EDC study, we have, may have misspelled entries. A good example is hypernatremia versus hyponatremia. This could be something, uh, there's, these are very different things, and, and sometimes the sites may misspell the entries or the entries may be illegible. So we, we, might, uh, we might introduce an error to our data from that. We can also have incomplete medical history. We may have some findings from physical exam or lab results you know, that are not recorded or may be recorded uh, as a different term and may need some clarification. So a lot of times you may have a lab report that has abnormal lab results and yet there's no, nothing indicated on the medical history uh, that uh, identifies that. So that would be probably a, a, a query that needs to be clarified. Uh, medical histories which have been specifically mentioned in the protocol that do not need to be recorded. For example, if it's a migraine study, we, we probably aren't probably don't need to record uh, migraine among the medical history items. We may have incomplete or missing start and stop dates. This happens a lot specifically in the medical history area because many times patients are going to have procedures uh, that they have uh, from uh, medical indications that have occurred you know long ago and they may not know what the dates were they might know, they may be they may know what year it is but they might not know what month or certainly what day it was so we may have some incomplete um, data in that regard some of that may be okay if it was long ago but we want to clarify as much of that as we can. We may have, we may see a large number of entries under one body system. Usually when you see that, there's probably an indication that some of those entries need to be into a, need to be recorded on a, on a separate uh, body system. Uh, we may have medical history that's listed on the concomitant medications page, but is actually missing from the medical history page. So say they're taking a a concomitant medication for say high blood pressure but then high blood pressure isn't listed on the medical history page that can be an error and these are pretty common mistakes that sites make so the next area we're going to talk about is the physical exam this is going to be where the uh, medical practitioner performs a physical examination of the patient and notes any uh, any assessment items that they've discovered uh, on there that they can actually see. So we're going to record those by body part on the CRF page. So depending on our study protocol, the uh, physical exam may be performed not only at the baseline or the screening visit, but it may be performed at other subsequent visits during the course of the trial. So once again, some of the common errors that we have, illegible entries, uh, that's going to be an error we might likely see. We might see where we have uh, entries recorded for different body systems at different visits. So maybe they have uh, you know, some sort of a respiratory infection that's recorded in the respiratory uh, section in one visit, but then it's recorded someplace else for subsequent visits. So these are some of the errors we might find. We might find abnormalities that should be recorded in medical history. For example, uh, we might notice a the practitioner might notice a surgical scar that's noted in the physical exam, but yet there's no corresponding entry on the medical history. Well, that could be a, that, that's a discrepancy that we need to, to clarify. You may have abnormalities, which might be adverse events, but are not listed on the adverse events page. For example, there might be a skin rash or some sort of uh, something like that that we may need to include on the adverse events page. So these are errors we might typically find. So the next page is adverse events. Um, an adverse event is any untoward medical occurrence that is associated with the use of a drug, whether or not it's considered drug related. 
So it's any change in the patient's medical condition during the course of a trial. And it could be anything from a headache to a heart attack. Now, some of these adverse events are going to be considered serious adverse events. The vast majority of them will not be considered serious adverse events. If it's deemed to be a serious adverse event, then the site's required to report that to the sponsor or the CRO within 24 hours of their learning about the adverse event. Doesn't mean they have to report it at the time of the adverse event because more than likely they're gonna learn about it you know, after it's already occurred. And then there are other reporting requirements for, um, for the sponsor to uh, report this information to the regulatory authority or the FDA. Uh, investigators must also complete the serious adverse event report and submit that to their institutional review board. Um, all adverse events should be recorded on the adverse event page regardless of whether the AE is serious or not. So it's important to understand that you know, adverse event can be almost anything. Uh, we're going to collect a lot of these for a lot, all the patients during the course of the trial. So it's not unusual to have you know, dozens of adverse events recorded. Some of the common errors that we normally encounter when we're reviewing adverse events, we may have start and stop date inconsistencies. Uh, for example, we're, if we have an adverse event and they've indicated that they're taking a, that they took a, a concomitant medication for that adverse event, then we need to have consistent start and stop dates. We don't want to have a start date for the concomitant medication that's prior to the, the start date for the adverse event. Um, we have uh, ongoing as indicated, but there is a stop date. So we'll see this in a little more detail as we review some specific examples of these pages. We also may have some inconsistent naming um, if we've got the same names or similar names appearing on the con medication, concomitant medication page. So we want to make sure that, that those names are consistent. We may have missing adverse events. We may have lab values that may indicate an AE, but then the site did not record an adverse event. I mean, this is a lot of, sometimes a lot of monitors miss these uh, because they don't carefully review that lab report uh, the way perhaps they should, and they might miss an adverse event. Uh, we have procedures that are listed instead of medical indications. For example, colonoscopy. That's a medical procedure. It's not a medical indication. So we need to clarify those and, and make sure that we get those recorded in the right, uh, on the right page. Concomitant medications. This page lists all medications that the subject has taken uh, both immediately prior to enrollment and while participating in the clinical trial. So that could be they may have chronic conditions that they're taking certain medications for, and we're going to record those, or the site is going to record those, uh, on the concomitant medications page. Regulatory authorities are going to use this data to understand the efficacy or safety effects of the investigational product uh, in relation to other drugs. So this data may produce drug interaction findings. So it's very important that we collect all of this information during the course of the trial and that the site is consistent in how they record this information. Some of the common errors that we're likely to find, illegible names of medications, we may have start and stop dates that don't match the medical history or the adverse event data. We could have dose and dose units that are not understood, that don't make any sense. Uh, we can have indications uh, that are not listed on the medical history or uh, adverse event pages. We could also have missing data. Uh, we probably want to collect things like, uh, like uh, the amount of dose that you're taking or that the patient is taking for a specific drug. Sometimes that may be omitted. We probably have to clarify that with the site. The study medication page. This is going to be a record of all the study medication that's taken by the subject, including date, time, dose, and dose unit. This would not only include what our investigational product is, but it could also include 
any uh, uh, any comparative products or other products that they might be taking in addition to the study medication. Common errors that we're likely to see in study medication, missing data. We may have time and or date and time discrepancies of when they took the medication. These are what we're likely to discover. We have study medication compliance. This is going to be a record of study drug dispensing information for each patient. This is going to capture the date and time and the amount of drug that was dispensed to the patient or was returned by the patient. So this data is usually used to calculate if the subject is taking sufficient medication to be considered uh, protocol compliant. And then we also want to, we, we determine that a patient is actually an analyzable subject so that uh, if they are compliant, and if they're not compliant, we want to want to find out why they aren't compliant. So some of the common errors that we might discover, medication numbers uh, dispensed, taken, and returned don't tally. So for example, we dispensed a certain number, but yet they return a greater number than what they should have returned. So the, the numbers don't add up. We've got dates of when medication were dispensed or returned that aren't logical, or they're not within the acceptable time ranges. Uh, we've got, we could have amount of medication dispensed for a specific visit is not per the protocol. So maybe they just, maybe the PI dispensed more or, or not enough. So we want to find out what the issues are with that. The drug labels. Drug labels are stickers that might come on a bottle of medication that we're going to dispense. Then once it's dispensed, we may uh, tear off part of that and put it on the CRF page or record it someplace um, in the dispensing log. Uh, these labels may contain randomization numbers or they may contain other information that we may need during the course of our trial. Some of the errors that we might discover uh, relative to drug labels. Labels might be missing for the dates the drug was dispensed as per the drug compliance page. We might have multiple labels that are pasted in the same box on a CRF uh, where normally a single label would be. These might be some common errors that we would encounter. So we have a study completion page. After the patient has completed the study, they'll come in for their final visit. At that point, we'll want to collect some specific information, such as the date of completion, or if they terminated from the study, what the date of termination was. We'll want to record what their date of last dose was. We'll also want to record the reason for the early termination, if indeed it is an early termination. So here are some of the common errors or mistakes that we see in the study completion page. The completion date is before the last visit date. That obviously doesn't make much sense. Uh, the principal investigator failed to sign the page. That would be an error. The reason for termination from the study doesn't match what's recorded on the adverse event page. For example, if they say, well, the reason I'm terminating is I'm suffering from headaches yet. We don't see any headaches uh, recorded on the adverse event page. We'd want to clarify that. Uh, another error we might find is the primary reason for termination is marked and the details field does not uh, don't match. For example, we might have indicated that the primary reason was an AE while what we marked was the subject withdrew consent. They just decided they didn't want to participate anymore. So we want to clarify these, and, and we do find a lot of these errors. So these pages generally require uh, some, some uh, further clarification. We want to make sure specifically if a patient is early terminating from the study, why they're doing it. And some final thoughts here. Good data review help ensure that we've got high quality data that can be reviewed uh, for our clinical trial. And then the higher the data quality is, the stronger the likelihood will be that our product will get approved by a regulatory authority. So this process is very important in helping to ensure that. 
So that concludes our lecture on entering and concluding or entering and, and reviewing data. So for your additional assignment for Moodle, what I want you to do is read uh, chapter four, which discusses the uh, edit checks, what they are, and we talked about that uh, up to this point. And then also chapter six, which uh, discusses receiving data on paper if you're using uh, paper CRFs. So at any rate, uh, have a great week, and I'll see you on the discussion board.